Heavenly Father, we present ourselves before you. And we're asking, O oh Lord, you will do all that you intend to do, and nothing will stand between us and you during this Congress in Jesus' name. As individuals, we present ourselves before you. As a body together, we present ourselves before you. And we're praying, O oh Lord, that you'll raise up great, effective, dynamic, fiery ministers out of us in Jesus' name. And we're praying that the work you have placed in our hands will prosper in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you'll grant us a great outpouring of your spirit and of your power and of your revelation so that we'll go back into the field and what we didn't know before we will know. What we couldn't do before we will do. And the results we couldn't have before, we will have them in Jesus' name. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in our ministries. And speak to everyone, even at this time, in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, God bless you. Please be seated. As we approach uh, the introduction to the Congress, and we come to this uh, first message in the Congress, the Lord is talking to us about what it means to be ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors in the ministry, and the people that are called of the Lord and commissioned of the Lord, equipped by the Lord to do what He has called us to do. As we think about ourselves one by one, we are referred to by many titles and many names in the word of God. As we refer to ourselves as a body of ministers, a body of believers, we are also referred to in some special ways in the scripture. And what we are looking at today, we are taking one of those titles in the scripture that describes a man of God, a minister of the gospel, that describes a representative, a representative of the Lord, that describes an harvester in the harvest of these last days. A description that tells us who we are as it pertains to the ministry, as it pertains to the work that we are called to do. And that is the title of the ambassador. We are referred to as ambassadors. And you might know what ambassadors do. In the natural, an ambassador is a minister who represents the government of his own country in a foreign country, in a foreign land. When you think about an ambassador then, in the Christian sense, you think of an ambassador in missionary sense. You think of an ambassador in a ministerial sense. You think of an ambassador as a Christian leader, as a Christian worker. You are thinking about someone called of God appointed of God, chosen of God, equipped by the Lord, and sent forth. And is sent into foreign land. Where is the foreign land? This place is a foreign land. This country is a foreign land. And the country you come from is a foreign land. Which one is the homeland? That is heaven. We have been sent by the power of God. We have been sent by the Lord himself from the heavenly country, our home country, because we belong to heaven, we belong to the kingdom of heaven, and we are sent to foreign land, foreign countries, as ambassadors of peace, ambassadors of grace, ambassadors of love, ambassadors with divine authority and power. You understand that as you are here today, and you represent the government of heaven, and you represent the Lord Almighty in all his power, in all his authority. And you represent him in all his love and grace. He, is, he has sent you forth already. But I want you to understand why he sent you forth. What he sent you to do, number one, to represent the God of heaven. That he is represent the God of truth and love and power. What a ministry. What a calling. What a commitment. And if you are going to represent the God of truth, you must have the truth of God. If you are going to represent the, truth, the God of love, you must have the love of God. If you are going to represent the God of power, you must have the power of God in your life. Understand then, number one, you are saying as ambassador. 
from the home country, the country of heaven, the government of heaven, and you're sent here to a foreign land to represent the God of heaven, the God of truth, the God of love, the God of grace, the God of power. Number two, you're sent to proclaim Christ as King, as Savior, as Lord, as a right ruler, as the one appointed by the Almighty God to rule and to reign. And he shall reign, and you are proclaiming that as if it's taking place already because evangelically Christ is establishing his kingdom in the heart of men and then eschatologically is going to establish his kingdom all over the earth and you are saying to tell the world and proclaim that Christ is Lord and Savior and Christ is King number three you are saying to reveal heaven's will and turns men's hearts away from the usurper and turn their hearts unto the Lord, unto the creator, the redeemer, and the ruler. You are an ambassador, sent from the home country, sent from the country of heaven, and you are sent to the foreign land, and you are sent to turn the hearts of men and women away from the devil, away from the usurper, and you are sent that they will know, they will understand. That the same God that is creator is also redeemer and is ruler as well. Number four, you are sent into the world, into the foreign land to protect, to preserve, and to provide, and to teach the kingdom citizens to prepare them for glory. You know that when an ambassador is sent to a foreign country, he cares for the interests of the citizens of his own country in a place where, where he has gone. And here in this world, we have some kingdom citizens. That is the people that belong to the kingdom of heaven. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ already. And the king is reigning in their heart. And they are already in that spiritual kingdom. And you want to protect the interests of those kingdom citizens in the country where you are. You want to preserve them and provide for them and teach them what it means for them to bring glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Number five, you are saying to that foreign land, and you are saying to the place you have gone, where you are now, where you are ministering, to establish and prepare the people of God for glory. You are saying to establish them. And as you establish them, establishing them in the truth. In the grace of God, in the might and the power of God. How they will live a life under the authority and the power of the Lord to bring glory unto the Lord. Number six, to establish God's rule, divine rule in individual hearts and in churches and communities of God's people. As we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. If any man be in Christ. Now, yeah, I know you've read that a lot of times, but I suppose you read it like this. If any minister be in Christ, and you want to ask me, isn't every minister in Christ? You are the best judge. You understand? You know, a lot of ministers around you that might not be in Christ, that might not be born again, that might not know the Lord. You are the best judge. Is every minister in Christ? Think about that. But if a minister be in Christ, it's a new creature. It's a new creation. The creative power of the Almighty God has taken effect, has taken root in the life of such a minister. And in life, is a new creature. In ministry, is a new creature. In understanding, is a new creature. In authority, is a new creature. And in the understanding of the call and the commission he has from the Lord, is a new creature. In being able to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, is not the way he was before he became a minister that he is today. He is a new creature. He is new within and he is new without. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. That's the minister. That's the man of God as a child of God and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself 
by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's a ministry. That's what the ambassadors do. They are representatives of God. They are representatives of Christ. And the ambassadors of Christ, we go into the world and the people that are at enmity with the Lord will turn their minds and we reconcile them unto the Lord. To we, that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation. He has committed unto us the message and the truth. That's the evangelical truth of telling people, be you reconciled unto God. And then in verse 20, now then, we are what? Tell me out loud. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's who we are. And when you bring all of us together from various parts of this country and from different countries in this continent and outside this continent, you bring us together. That's an army of soldiers. That's an army, an assembly of ambassadors. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. You will see very clearly there then. He refers to us as ambassadors. And he has brought us here into this conference, into this congress, so that he can renew us. He can revive us. He can refresh us. He can revitalize us and put some new energy, dynamism into us so that we'll go back into ministry and we'll do what we're called upon to do. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18 all through to verse 20. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 18, praying always, not sometimes, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, Paul the Apostle said, and for me, that all trust may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an, for which I am an ambassador. And then he says, ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. When you stand and you declare the word of God, you are declaring the word of God as an ambassador. And you are to declare the word of God with boldness, fearlessness, with power, with conviction, with authority, standing on both your legs and looking at the people straight in the face and telling them, thus says the God of heaven. And telling them what the Almighty God demands. And what the Almighty God provides through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say that with all boldness and authority. No man despising your ministry. So that you'll be able to effectively represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I pray that all we need to make us what we ought to be. As dynamic, as bold, as fearless, as faithful as we ought to be. The Lord will give it to us in this place in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 2. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning. Our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoils shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar. As the running to and fro of the locusts shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted for he dwelleth on high. He has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. And strength of salvation fear. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Behold their valiant one shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. 
that he is the ambassador of peace, that is, uh, the people that are proclaiming the peace of the Lord. When you see the people that are not for peace and they do not have the peace of God in their hearts, they have not been justified by faith, they go into intercession and they weep bitterly, weeping for the people that do not know the Lord. And eventually the Lord will answer the prayer and many people be converted into the, unto the Lord and into the gospel and great will be the people that come to know the Lord. In verse 10, now will I rise, says the Lord. Now will I be exalted, now will I lift up myself. Ye shall conceive chaff, and ye shall bring postable. Your breasts as fire, I shall devour you. And the people shall be as burnings of lime. And as sun shall cut up, shall they be burnt in the fire. And then it says in verse 18, In verse 18, Thine heart shall meditate terror. That is, when you see the judgment of God, when you see the conviction of God, when you see the power of God, bending the minds of the people then you begin to meditate how terrible and how wonderful and great overpowering the power of the Lord is where is the scribe where is the rece receiver where you see that counted the towers thou shalt not see a fierce people a people of deeper speech than thou canst perceive out of his stammering talk that thou canst not understand look unto Zion the city of her solemnities and I shall see Jerusalem in quiet habitation a tabernacle that shall not be taken down not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed neither shall any of the cause thereof be broken is just describing what will actually happen at the time the Lord himself will do great and mighty things and I believe that the Lord during this time will so fashion and remold us, will become instrument of his glory and instrument of his power in Jesus' name. This assembly of Christian ambassadors, that is, those of us who are here, and those who will be hearing this message, this message on cassette later, we need the Lord. We need renewal, do we? We need refashioning, remodeling, do we? And we need refreshing from on high. We need reassurance and revelation and revival and recommissioning. That's the reason we have come together. And I believe that this reason we have come together, the Lord will definitely fulfill and do for every one of us in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen there. Now, we're going to divide to three parts this message today. Number one, the making of redeemed Christian ambassadors. The making the making of redeemed Christian ambassadors. Number two, the might of renewed Christian ambassadors. The might, the strength, the power, the dynamite that comes into you. The might of redeemed, renewed Christian ambassadors. Number three, the ministry of renewed Christian ambassadors. Number one, the making of redeemed Christian ambassadors to make. When it says to make, in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 19, and it says unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Here the Lord Jesus Christ calls some simple-hearted people. Some normal, ordinary people like you and I. And he said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And you, you understand there are two parts to that sentence, to that statement. The first part is follow. And the second part is what he says he will do. And I will make you fishers of men. There is a human part. There is the divine part. God's part. There is the human responsibility. And there is the divine ability that he puts into you. And remakes you. And remolds you. And he does something in you that you are not what you used to be. When you do the first part in following, then he does the second part in making and molding. The promise to make, making us fishers of men. 
It's a promise to make, to form, to fashion, to mold, to build, to recreate, to chisel us. Cast something out of you that wasn't there before. To make us ministers, ambassadors, so that we can fully represent him and become effective tools and instruments in his hand to fish out men from the sea of humanity. That's what it means. He wants to remold us. He wants to remake us. He wants to reform us. He wants to refashion us. And he wants to so build us up, chisel out a lot of things in our lives, and bring out a minister, an effective minister, a mighty, powerful, fruitful minister, so that we will be capable, effective, dynamic, fruitful ministers of the gospel with the ability to fish out men out of the sea of humanity. He wants us to be able to go out there and to draw out the people, cleanse the people, convert the people, preserve the people, conserve them and perfect them in his kingdom. And he says what he'll do is to make us and so I'm appealing to you that during this Congress, you will yield yourself so completely to the Lord. And you will follow the Lord the way He wants you to follow Him. And you will so yield to the Lord, surrender to the Lord, abandon yourself to the Lord, so that the Lord will have a chance to do what He wants to do and make you a fisher of men. It is making us what He wants to make us, he actually does that in a process. He trains us. He equips us. He transforms us. He strengthens us. He empowers us until he can reproduce himself in us. And when he reproduces himself in us, the final product that we see, he become an able minister of the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who has also made us. Do you see that? You go through the New Testament, and then you, you see like an invisible line between John, the last chapter of John, and the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And you follow the disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you see their lifestyle. And you see their weakness. And you see how they will tremble before the enemy. And you will see how they will deny at the time that Jesus Christ was betrayed. And you will see their weak knees. And you will see their feeble conviction. And you will see their frailty. But then you cross an invisible line in, at the end of the gospel according to St. John. And you move on into the Acts of the Apostles. And as you find them in Acts chapter 1, even before the power descended upon them, you can find the unity in prayer. You find them in chapter 2, you almost cannot recognize Peter again because he stood up and challenged all the people. I'm talking about this timid fellow that said, I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, if you are thinking about what happened to these people, these are not drunk as you are thinking. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ being glorified has poured down his power. By the time he finished speaking, the people were, convert they were convicted men and brethren. What shall we do? 3,000 people were converted. You follow him to chapter 3 and then you find silver and gold by none. What I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk in chapter 4. By what authority and what power have you done? done this if we be examined as to what power what authority we have done this be it known unto you that this same jesus that you crucified the cornerstone that you rejected he has become the chief of the corner there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of jesus what are you talking about before he even lands there you find him in chapter 5 just walking about and a shadow healing the sick i'm telling you that there, it appears like there's an invisible line between the gospels and the acts of the apostles and then you find out what is happening he has made 
them able ministers of the new covenant of the new testament able ministers of the new covenant able capable dynamic effective and fruitful and bold and fearless that's what the lord promised i will make you fishers of men i pray the lord will do it at this time i say the lord will do it at this time in verse 6 was made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And so you see that, you know, for them, the Lord had done it. And the Lord is going to do it for us. I say the Lord is going to do it for us. In um, Isaiah chapter 41, see the promise of the Lord, what he says he will do. In Isaiah chapter 41, I'm reading to you from verse 14 and verse 15. Isaiah 41 verse 14. Fear not, the worm... Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, says the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp instrument. I want you to notice again that invisible line. If, if you just read your Bible, and you just read over, just read over, you'll not understand. You know many verses in the head, and you never apply them to your life. There's an invisible line here. In verse 14, thou warm Jacob. And you, and you know what a warm is. You know how weak a warm is. You know almost how lifeless a warm might appear to be. And you know that it doesn't stand, it doesn't have strength, it's not rigid, it's not solid, it's not firm. It's something you can crush to death by just stamping them with your feet. But after that invisible line, after I will help you, says your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I will make you a new, sharp, threshing instrument, having teeth. Something has taken place there. And the Lord, by his power, his miracle working power, had taken hold of this worm and then transformed this worm that it's not like it was before. And all the frailties of the past and all the weaknesses of the past, everything will eventually pass away. And it says, you'll become a sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and thou shalt make the hills as chaff. That's what the Lord wants to do. And these are the promises of God. And when we allow the Lord to do what he wants to do, is the making of the ambassadors. It's the making of the representatives. It's the making of the instruments in the hands of the Lord to do something in this final day. In Jeremiah chapter 1. The process of making these redeemed ambassadors in Jeremiah chapter, 3, chapter 1, verse 17. Therefore, and thou therefore gather up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city. Now, if you read from verse 1 of the chapter, you will see that by the time the Lord was speaking to Jeremiah and he was saying, I'm sending you forth, I'm sending you out, and I want you to go, you and go and do this. And Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. How can I do that? And the Lord said, don't say I'm a child. I've given you responsibility and you're going to do it. And then eventually here, by the time you come to the end of the chapter, the Lord said, I have made you this very day a defense city and an iron pillar it bracing walls against the whole land against the kings of judah against the princes thereof against the priests thereof against the people of the land and they shall fight against thee and that's where some people stop they say there's too much difficulty on the field they say there's too much difficulty in the place of assignment they say the fighting and the persecution and the opposition and the criticism is almost unbearable. But uh, don't stop there. They shall fight against thee, but tell me the rest. Tell me out loud. Tell me like you are preaching. 
they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver thee. The Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. Now, you, you see what he says here? You see what he says here? He says, I have made thee already. By the time you come to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. I'm reading verses 20 and 21. Jeremiah chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. And I will make thee unto this people a first brazen wall. I have made thee. Well, the level of your ministry in chapter 1 have made you strong enough. A fair city. And in chapter 1, all the people you meet, they'll fight against you. Well, the limits of your ministry have done enough for you. Go ahead and work. By the time he came to chapter 15, he needed greater strength, greater protection, and greater power. And greater authority. And the Lord was saying, yes, I did that in chapter 1. That was okay for chapter 1. That was okay for the challenges of chapter 1. That was okay for the responsibility in chapter 1. All through to the following chapters. In the challenges you are meeting now. In the difficulties you are meeting now. And in the weight of the ministry that you have now. I will make thee. Unto these people, a first prison wall, and they shall fight against you once again, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, says the Lord. I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. We're secured. I said, We're secured. The Lord Himself is on our side. And there is nothing that can bring us down in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. He is not telling us the means by which he equips us. The means by which he develops us. The means by which he trains us. The means by which he makes or removes and transforms us to be the people and the ministers we ought to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11, and he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For what reason? For the perfecting of the saints. That's what perfecting there means, for the equipping of the saints. Until they come to the complete stress they ought to come to. For the work of the ministry. Equipping those saints. Developing those saints. Perfecting those saints. Chiseling the lives and ministries of those saints. Sharpening the, them as tools and instruments in the hands of the Lord. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come. In the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See where we're going. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where we're going. You are not there yet, but you're on the road. You are not there yet, but you're moving on. And what the Lord wants to see is that He will so make us. It will so remold us until the life of Christ is completely reproduced in us and the ministry of Christ is completely reproduced in us until we all come in the unity of the faith unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How will this happen? Because we know God cannot fail. God will do what he says he'll do. But he has given us a challenge. He has given us the condition. He has given us the terms. That we have to do our part. Follow me and then I will make you to become fishers of men. What's our part? A lot of things. But let me read this to you. In Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 28. As thou not known... Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. He giveth power to the faint. You are coming from the field and you've met a lot of challenges. And maybe you 
I've come almost to the point of fainting, almost to the point of giving up. Almost like the road is too rough. The challenges are too great. The difficulty is too much. The need is overwhelming. And the, the, the ministry, I don't know what I'm going to do again. You're fainting. But as you come to this Congress and you look up to the Lord, He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. As we come over here to this Congress, we do not want uh, anyone to live and act and talk and behave and move as if we were just ordinary Christians in a general retreat. We do not want us as ministers of the gospel, as ambassadors of Christ, as leaders in the church, to be like new converts or invitees to a retreat that when we ought to pray, we are talking. When we ought to wait upon the Lord, we are here and there. When we ought to be in the midst of the people of God, we are outside the gate or we are on the road. Or we are at the car park. And we do not want us to look like people that were invited to deeper life. As if you have never been in a deeper life meeting before. And some of the leaders have to be reminding us. The meeting has started. What are you doing here? The other people are praying. Why are you standing out and talking in that place? From where are you? I'm from this place. How about you? I'm from, you're from the same town. Have you not had enough time chatting, talking, doing whatever, where you came from? Over here, didn't you understand? You came here so that you can be prepared for a higher ministry, a greater ministry, a better ministry, a richer ministry, a more effective ministry. Why don't you spend the time moving there and wait upon the Lord? We do not want any of us to act in such a way and behave in such a way as if we were new converts or we were sinners outside that have never known, have never drunk the water of the gospel, that you don't even know what it means, the very basics of the gospel, that we have to be putting pressure on you and putting pressure on you. Why don't you do it this way? Why don't you go in and pray? We want us to be people that are matured and people that came here and we know what we ought to do and we know that we came here for a serious thing. We want the Lord to make us what he ought to make us and if we know that we know that and we want to act as if we know that, we wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How many of you want to renew your strength? Praise the Lord. God bless every one of you. But you know, if you really want to renew your strength, you'll do something that will be in the line of renewing strength. Talking and talking and talking like something to Delilah will not give you strength. It will sap your energy. It will destroy you. And it will not make you the kind of minister that you ought to be. I told you in the church yesterday, I said I told you because even if you are not at the headquarters, you are, you know, your various locations and you saw and you heard. If you do what you always did, you will get what you always got. If you loaf the way you always loved, you will end in the place you always ended. If you are prayerless, the way you are prayerless, you will be powerless as you are always powerless. If you travel on the same road that you always traveled, 
you will get to the same destination you always got to. That's the reason as you're coming here, you want to manifest, demonstrate a change of approach, a change of attitude, a change of disposition, a change of receptivity. You want to so receive the word of God, accept the word of God, embrace the word of God. I want something different in my life. I want something different in my ministry. I want my strength to be renewed. If that is what you want, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk, and they shall not faint. Let the Lord have his way in our lives, in molding and making and remolding and remaking us, and we will be the able, capable ministers of the gospel we ought to be in Jesus' name. Point number two, the might, the power, the strength, the ability, the might of renewed Christian ambassadors, the might of renewed Christian ambassadors. In Micah chapter 3, verse 8. Micah chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 8. Here is a testimony of this man of God. And this ought to be our testimony. If we want the power of God and the might of the Lord in our lives. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Here the minister, the prophet of God testified and he said, I'm full of power. I'm full of strength. I'm full of divine ability transferred, injected into me. I'm full of the might of the Lord. To be able to declare unto Israel his sin. Isn't that what the Lord has called us to do? And who can do that effectively without the Spirit of God? Without the power of God? Without the might of God? The Lord wants to so renew our lives. That then he will be able to send us back. With might, strength, power, ability, divine ability. So that we will be able to declare the will of God. The revelation of truth. And then men's hearts will be convicted, converted, and turned unto the Lord. And let me show you some examples. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, we're actually reading about an Old Testament character, but we're looking at uh, what it says about him in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses, learned, wise, mighty in words and uh, deeds. In um, Deuteronomy, this one spells everything out for us. Concerning this great man of God, having might, power, ability, strength, to fully represent the Lord the way the Lord had called him and to what the Lord had called him to. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10 And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Uh, that was, that's the person that actually had the might of the Lord. And he fully represented the Lord, whether it was in Egypt or in the wilderness or anywhere. He fully represented the Lord. You think about the ministry of Moses. Look at him before the Red Sea. He represented the Lord fully. And look at him as the people needed food. He represented the Lord fully. And look at him when the people had murmured and snakes were biting them and they were dying. And in their strength and health and recovery, he represented the Lord fully. And look at when the water was bitter and they didn't they need water to drink, he represented the Lord fully. Whatever need appeared among the children of Israel in the wilderness, anytime he represented the Lord fully. 
And that's what the Lord is calling us to. Whatever challenge we face in ministry, wherever we may find ourselves, to be able to represent the Lord fully as the ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the people need knowledge, you're able to give it to them. They need healing, you're able to give it to them. They need miracles, you're able to give it to them. They need recovery uh, from their backsliding, you're able to help them out. Whatever it is they need, encouragement, counseling, wisdom, you're able to help them out. And there is no time when they would say, I needed this, but the representative of the Lord in our region, in our state, in our nation, in our locality, was not able to do it because he himself was at sea. He didn't know what to do. We should be able to represent the Lord fully, whatever the situation of the people of God. That will take the might of the Lord. As you look at Second Kings, let's see another man that had this might of the Lord. And if they were able to have it, why not you? Why not me? Second Kings chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. Here is uh, when Elijah was asking Elisha to ask whatever you want before I be taken away from you. And then Elisha replied as to what he wanted. And you know why he wanted that. In 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 9, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. That's what he needed. That's what he wanted. He needed that so that after Elijah had gone, and then he will face the challenges of the ministry, he'll be able to represent, fully represent the Almighty God that appointed him unto the business, unto the ministry of caring for the children of God as the prophet replacing Elijah. And eventually, you know the story. He got the power until the people were able to testify in, chapter, in verse 15. And when the sons of the prophet which were to be what Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. What's the evidence? Look at this. In Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. Looking at it from verse 8. Of course, after this, uh, chapter 2, you go into chapter 3, you see some evidence there. You go to chapter 4, you see some evidence there. You go to chapter 5, you see some evidence there. Are you getting something? What I'm saying to you is, every chapter of his life, every chapter of his ministry, every moment of his ministry, every period of his ministry, that's the implication. After he got that power and might, and strays of the Lord in a double portion. Every chapter, every moment, every period, every day, every program of his ministry after that, there was a sign that he had got something. The hand of the Lord had come upon him. He had been remolded, refashioned, and revived, and filled with the power of the Lord. Uh, that is what the Lord is challenging us to think about. That after you say you meet the Lord, after the Lord brings something, a dynamite in your life. Every program after that, every moment after that, every day after that, every challenge after that, there should be an evidence. The spirit of Elijah comes upon Elisha. In chapter 6, now reading from verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8, then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And to counsel with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my calm. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned of him up, and saved him there, not once, not twice. What's that? Revelation, the word of knowledge. And that was able to help him in his ministry in protecting Israel and the king of Israel. And therefore the heart of the king of the king of Syria was so troubled for their sin. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, tell us the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy best chamber. 
And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore said he, see the chariots and horses, and a great host, and they came by night, and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he said, Fear not. This man had got something. A chariot of horses. A chariot, a chariots and horses all around the city just for this man. And then the servant was so much afraid and said, My father, my master, what shall we do? All he said is, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. No wonder the man was not afraid. I will not be afraid what... Thousands of men can do against me because the Lord has said, I will never leave you and I will never, I will never forsake you. Therefore, I may boldly say, I will not fear what man shall do against me. That's where Elisha was. That's the power that surrounded him. That's the conviction that he had within him. That's the reason why when the servant was afraid, there's no out of fear in him. And then we're told in verse 18, and when they, came, they were come down, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. You know the story yourself. I'm just telling you that this man too was full of power and he was full of might. And the Lord has promised us the same thing. He'll fill us with power. He'll fill us with the Holy Ghost. Then we'll be able to go out in the might of the Lord, in the strength of the Lord. And we will do what he has called us to do. And we will not be shirking away from our responsibility or duty. We'll not be running away from the field thinking, I cannot do this, I cannot do this. Why can't you, why can't you do? Because if you have the strength of the Lord and the might of the Lord, the challenges of the field will not drive you back. You will be able to do what the Lord has sent you to do. You will be an effective, able, capable minister of the New Testament, the manifestation of power, the manifestation of divine strength and might will be in your ministry. But understand, that manifestation of power, that manifestation of, manifestation of strength and might, in ministry is proportional to the presence of God in you, to the partnership of God with you, and to the prominence of God in you, to the outpouring and the plenitude of the Holy Ghost in your ministry. The manifestation of the power, the manifestation of the strength and the might of God in you and in your ministry is so much proportional to the presence and the partnership and the prominence and the outpouring and the fullness, that's what I mean by the plenitude, of the Holy Spirit in your ministry. The might and the power to reveal man's heart to himself. That will depend upon the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. The might and the power to convict men of sin until they are compelled to cry out to God in repentance. That will depend upon the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost in your life and ministry. The power and the might to lift up penitent man from his state and to behold the grace of God and to hold up the love of God before him, the salvation of the Lord before him, that will depend upon the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that comes into your life and your ministry. About the might and the power to impart spiritual life, healing, health, deliverance, dominion unto the people you are ministering to. That will depend upon the might of the Spirit of God in your life. The power, the might to reproduce Christ's nature in God's children by the ministry of proclamation, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord, proclaiming the word of God. And then as you proclaim that word in power, in authority, with the dynamite of the Holy Ghost in your ministry, you are able to reproduce Christ's nature in God's children. And then the power, the might, to lead believers to courage and steadfastness. Where religious fanatics 
or religious people or cultic people are intimidating the people of God and people are afraid to come to church and people are afraid to serve the Lord and people are afraid to stand for the truth and people are afraid to make restitution and people are afraid to be obedient to the word of the Lord because the majority of neighbors around them they happen to be people that discourage them and people that will not allow them to stand for the truth the power and the might in the minister to be able to lead the believers under your care to courage faithfulness, steadfastness. That will depend upon the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost in your life and in your ministry. The power, the might to raise up unconquerable soldiers of the cause and fruitful soul winners. That will come from the Holy Spirit. That's why we must be filled with the Spirit of God. And that's why Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Then he said, and ye shall receive power, not weakness. And ye shall receive power, not timidity. And ye shall receive power, not fear. And ye shall receive power, not cringing, compromising. I'm afraid of what they will say. I'm afraid of what they will do. I'm afraid of what their reaction will be. And so we cannot tell the truth. And if we tell the truth, we have to cover our mouths before we tell the truth. Come in for the power of the Holy Ghost. When you're filled with power, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the dynamite of heaven comes into you. And it says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem where Christ was crucified where Peter denied the Lord where John ran away where all the rest of the disciples were scattered in that same Jerusalem a few weeks after that actually about 50 days after the crucifixion you'll be able to stand before a multitude of those same people in Jerusalem and you'll be able to declare the word of God with authority and boldness and power and no man will be able to shut you up and the conviction will come upon them when you testify in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's why the Lord is calling us and challenging us and is saying be filled with the Holy Ghost. It will happen in Jesus' name. Because you see, here is what we need. The might that the Lord will give until we, the ambassadors of Christ, for this hour, for this generation, are renewed in the strength of the Lord. Number one is the making of such ambassadors. Number two is the might of the ambassadors. Number three, the ministry of renewed Christian ambassadors. The ministry of renewed Christian ambassadors. I pray the Lord will give you a good ministry. And as you operate in that ministry, and that ministry will be effective by the grace of God. In, Isa, in uh, Psalm 51, Psalm 51, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Psalm 51, reading from verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Can you look up here for a moment? There are people that hurt their own ministries. There are people that forget the reason for their calling into the ministry. There are people that keep on laboring 
and working and striving and struggling and sweating after the power, the presence, the might of the Lord has departed from their lives. They know that they need restoration from backsliding. They know that sin has eaten up the very fabric and center of their Christian lives and conviction. They know that as empty bags, they cannot stand upright. They know the position without the power means nothing in the territory of the enemy. They know that going out to shake yourself after you put your head on the lap of Delilah will not produce anything. Shaking does not break the power of the Holy Ghost if you have been in communion, sin, partnership, evil with Delilah, with the woman of the world. Going out and shaking yourself I'll do it like I used to do it. It doesn't bring anything. And there are people that keep on laboring like that. And they do not stop to think, to say, I've missed it. I'm backsliding. There is secret sin. And because of the secret sin, there's no amount of shaking. There's no amount of shouting that will do anything. And you hurt yourself. And you hurt your ministry. And you hurt the sinners. Because the sinners will not respond to your shouting. And they're not going to respond to all the gimmicks and to all the methods and to all the strategies. That's why David, David realized this. He had backslidden. If you, you know his story. He had committed sin. The sin of adultery. Not only that, to cover up the adultery. He had gotten rid of the husband of the woman. He was still on the throne. The position was there. But the authority had gone. The power had gone. The presence of the Lord had gone. All that came upon him was the judgment of God. David, thank you for giving us the revelation that a man under judgment cannot deliver the sinners under judgment. A backslider under judgment cannot deliver backsliders and sinners who are under the judgment of God. A person that is having guilt and condemnation for sin. A person that is under the judgment of the Almighty God because of the immorality or because of the murder. He cannot at the same time, no matter the shouting or the shaking, he cannot deliver the sinners who are under the terrible, terrifying judgment of God. That's why he said, Lord, I need something here. Create in me a clean heart. My heart is dirty. Renew within me a right spirit. I have a wrong spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence. I know that if something is not done, there will be a permanent break, a permanent separation between me and the Almighty God because your sins have separated you between you and the Lord. And then he says, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. You have grieved the Holy Spirit by your sin, by your adultery, by your murder. And the Holy Spirit will not dwell in that dirty vessel. And he's saying, oh Lord, oh Lord, I know what I've done. I know what the, where the Spirit of God is now. It cannot be in this unclean, unsanctified, unsaved, unconverted, backsliding heart anymore. And then he said, restore to me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. All I have now is the joy of my position as king. All I have now is the joy of the fact that, well, I'm still king and they have not voted me out. Thank God there is no election here in Israel. Thank God it is by the proclamation of Samuel. And you cannot remove somebody by election, by voting him out, if God appointed him and put him there. But I know that even though the position is there, the experience is not there. Therefore, I'm asking for the experience now. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit. Then he said, then, only then. Can I evangelize? Then and only then will I be able to teach the transgressors 
thy way. I'll be able to tell them I was there, but the Lord brought me out. I'll be able to tell them I was a backslider to your bottom restored. Then will I be able to tell them I was in the very depths of sin, of guilt, and of condemnation. But the Lord Jesus, but, but the Lord, because of his grace and his might and his power and his love, because of his mercy, he dug me out of my pit. Then will I be able to teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. If you are there today, and you know that you are a sinner. If you are there today, and you know you are a backslider. If you are there today, you are still keeping position. You are still keeping the ministry. You are still keeping the title. And you know that you are not right with the Lord. What the Lord wants you to do, if you don't want to hurt yourself, hurt the ministry, and seal the sinners in their sins, and harden their consciences, that they will not be able to wake up and get convicted and come out of their sin. If you don't want to do that, if you want sinners to be converted unto the Lord, if you want backsliders to be restored unto the Lord, you go to the Lord in prayer. You repent before the Lord. You understand this is a place where the Lord wants to make us and mold us and refashion us and rebuild us up. And then you'll be able to teach the transgressors and the sinners will be converted unto the Lord. I believe the Lord will do it. I said I believe the Lord will do it. What do you think would have happened if after Peter, Simon Peter, if after he denied the Lord and the Lord looked back at him and what could the Lord do in the physical? After all, they are taking him to the place of crucifixion. After all, he cannot come back to me and say, why did you do that? Ah, I'm going to tell John and the others. What if Peter did not do anything? Just shrugged the shoulders and said, and so what? Am I the first person that that ever happened to? And he went his way. No tears of repentance. No conviction for sin. And he went in the pride of the natural man. And he didn't care what he felt in the heart, the look of Jesus or whatever. Just went his way. If he continued like that, in that hardness of heart, without repentance, without the tears of sorrow, without yielding to the Lord. What do you think would have happened? He would have been, the Lord would have passed him by on the day of Pentecost. But see what the tears of repentance did. When Jesus rose from the dead, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter also. And then he followed him up to the seaside. And he recalled him, lovest thou me? Yes, I love you. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. What if he missed those words? What words do you think, do you know you are missing? If you do not come to the Lord in repentance, if you see that something has happened in your life, and all the messages you have had, and everything has not restored you back to where you ought to be, would you like to go through this Congress just like you came, still the same? And then Pentecost will pass you by. And then Acts chapter 3, the signs and the wonders that could have happened through you will pass you by. God forbid. May the Lord lay his hand upon you that you will not rest until you find your rest at Calvary. That you will not rest until you fully surrender to the Lord and you say, Lord, am I playing? Am I wasting my time? Look at the time since you called me. 
Look at the time since you give me the promise, I will make you fishers of men. What's happening to me? Look at all these years. When are you going to make me the man, the woman, the minister I ought to be? What will you do for me within this week? How are you going to remold my life, remodel my life, refashion my life, remake my life until I become a representative of Christ in my place, in my area, in my territory, so that I will know, the people will know by the evidence of your presence and your power in my life that a remaking, a recreation has taken place in my life. When are you going to do it? The Lord is saying, that depends on you. I can do it anytime and any day. And I want to even do it at this time. If you will allow me, will you allow the Lord? I said, will you allow the Lord? And can I just throw a challenge at you? If you know why you are here, and you really want the Lord to make you, make you the able minister and capable minister of the new covenant. You'll make up your mind that here you will pray. Where you are sleeping, you will pray. During the day, you will pray. In the night, you will pray. Why don't you test the Lord just for this week? And put the Lord to a test. And say, alright Lord, I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to abandon every other thing. I'm going to just abandon myself unto you. All this chat, 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 talk, 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 and all that. I'm going to abandon that for this week. And I'm going to stretch myself spiritually, my full strength on the altar, at the foot of the cross. And I'm going to say, Lord, that promise to remake me, that promise to remold me, that promise to recreate me and refashion me, do it this week, remember. Since the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. You're not going to use the force on your neighbor. You use the force on your own kind of lukewarmness. You use the force on yourself. Your, yourself that you know you are dragging, you are prayerless, you don't know what you are going to do. It's like you don't know what's happening to you to read the Bible apart from preaching or to pray unto the Lord or to tell the Lord, oh Lord, do what you said you will do. It's like somebody needs to push you before it happens. But you say at this time, if I need to push myself, if I need to drag myself, if I need to just get on my knees or get on my face and say, Lord, do something. In this Congress, the Lord is going to do it. If you will mean business like that for the Lord, only those who want to mean business for the Lord, can you stand up and say, Lord, I come now. You must make something out of me. This is the time. You will make something out of me. I don't want to go back the way I came. This is not my first congress. I came before. Where is the result? I've attended the retreat. Where is the result? Where is the fulfillment of your promise? I want you to make me, to mold me, to refashion me, to recreate me. And I want you to so do it that your might and your power will work in my life. The energy of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit will be in me in a mighty way until even the people that knew me before they'll be able to see there is a making, there is a might and there is a new kind of ministry that is coming out of this individual my brother let God do something my sister let God do something don't make this a congress like another general retreat don't make it like we came before don't make it like congress as usual let something different, something spectacular let it come out of this that you stretch yourself spiritually, visualize yourself visualize yourself, stretching yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ at the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, oh Lord here am I, do something in me, do something in me from this very night from this very night, from this very night and even all through the night and in the morning and the following day you will do something in me it, there must be a difference there must be a difference, following the Lord for three years, following the Lord for seven years following the Lord for ten years reading the Bible through and through so many times, there must be an evidence you must do something in me a recreation, a remodeling, a 
refashioning that you will do and i will know that something different has happened unto me open your mouth talk to the lord let god do something new in your life 